you, did you spot the Masonic handshake then? Ooh. Ooh. Someone down the front here's got red shoes on. I don't want any excuses off you. Her email's 666 at Hotman. That's the truth. Who, who here said I look younger in real life? Stand up. She gets free membership for life. So, four years. Four fucking years. Are you enjoying the view of my ass over there? I'm going to sit over here and watch Mark's ass. <laughs> well, you never see it on the, uh, on the podcast, do you? Anyway, so, do you like this? If there's any bad intentions in here, this is going to fuck you up. <laughs> That's called a translator. Works with the ether. Been using it to change weather recently. It's amazing. Egyptian, would you believe? And what the fuck is out there on the wall outside? Have you seen that? Did you all see the Egyptian stuff across the road? Let's go and have a look, come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. You've got to pay attention, come on. Look at that. Yeah, 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 no, actually. Have a quick look. Look at that. Come on, go in, go out, have a quick look. Have a quick look so you know what I'm talking about. Just go out and have a look and then come back in. Go and have a look, go on. Everybody go and have a look. Fast as you can and then come back in. Go on. Have a quick look and then come back in. It's mind blowing. Go and have a quick look if you've not seen it across the road. Mark Atwood, he knows how to clear a room. Did you fucking see that outside? What? And what's, what was the name of this country again? Scotland. Named after who? Scotia. Who's Scotia? Egyptian princess. Who's the granddaughter of who? Akhenaten. Who was pharaoh of Egypt for how many years, anybody? Anybody? 17. What the fuck? We're in the matrix. Yeah? If I glitch and turn into a cat, you know what's going on. Did you all see it? Did you see it outside? So, Edinburgh. It's just a stage she's going through. I've always wanted to do that joke. Um, Edinburgh has a very special place in my heart. And uh, the first thing I want to do is thank uh, Common Knowledge and all the amazing people involved for letting me come and try and hopefully I don't know, hopefully entertain you a little bit, educate hopefully a little bit, inspire you a little bit, give you, oh look at that, thank you Jane, you star, <laughs> the boss. I assume some of you have watched my podcast? No, no. <laughs> Fucking hell. Craig Campbell's on here next week. He's a comedian that I met in Edinburgh in 1996, I think, at the Tron Cayley House. Do you guys know that? Yeah. And we were downstairs and we were on, I was doing a play, I think. I was doing Rita Sue and Bob 2. Have you ever seen the film? Yeah. It's about a guy from Bradford who shags his babysitters and they're about 14. <laughs> and I played Bob. <laughs> What's that go over the internet? Mark's a pedophile. <laughs> 40,000 people end up paying to see my bare ass on stage. <laughs> and anyway, there were four comedians on after that, and they were called, I can't remember, I think they called themselves the Lumberjacks because they were Canadian. Craig Campbell, who's gonna be here next week, who's been on my show twice. Have you seen Craig being interviewed by me? He's amazing. He got completely blackballed by the comedy circuits uh, during COVID, and he rang me up and he said, and I'd not spoken to him for 25 years, nearly 28 years, I think. And he said, can you help me out? And we got him on the show. And then um, what was interesting about that four, group of four people, because there's no coincidences, is there? Everything has a meaning. That's why I just took you out to see the Egyptian stuff, because there's a reason, right? And Craig um, got on my show, and he was helped out by somebody, because he was totally ill and broke because of not towing the party line. So all the comedy clubs blackballed him, like, like a lot of musicians as well. 
But not that many, as it turns out. Most of the comedians are cunts, aren't they? Yeah, fucking cunts. And so the most of the musicians, all the celebrities, all sold their fucking souls somewhere along the way. But isn't it great, because COVID is the best thing that ever happened to the human race. Who agrees? <laughs> not me. Because we now know who everybody is, right? And that's incredible. And we're like, fucking hell, I had no idea. I was surrounded by so many cunts. <laughs> now I know. Oh, now I'm a bit depressed because the world's run by satanic pedophiles that eat children. Fuck. Oh, no, now I'm not depressed. And I'm gonna, what am I going to do now? I'm going to do something about it. I mean, there's two guys at the back who are living in a tent in Fife, which is a mate, and they're having a great time out of the system. Stand up. And, you know, they're loving it. Who does what's not to love about not having a fucking mort gauge? Which means death grip in French, by the way, if you didn't know. And a job. Who wants a job? You want a job? Give us a job. No thanks. Fuck off. I've not had a job since I left the RAF, but I'll get back to that. So you might know by now there's absolutely no structure. I have no idea what I'm going to say till I get on the stage. <laughs> I was talking about Craig Campbell. So when I started my podcast in 2020, there was one of the comedians was called Alan Park. Alan Park got in touch with me through a friend of his, and I interviewed him twice. And Alan unfortunately passed away about 18 months ago of cancer, but he'd fought it for 10 years using cannabis, right? And I had him on the show, unfortunately, interviewed him a couple of times, and though you can find all those on the markoutwardshow.com. All my interviews, thousands of them, uh, are on there. And Alan was a very inspirational guy, and so was Craig. So is Craig, because Craig's coming here to perform on the stage. How weird. We performed in Edinburgh 28 years ago together, and here I am a week before him. Timing's a bit off. But they're amazing guys. And um, what was I going to say about Craig? Yeah, so the interesting thing about that is one of my viewers... Uh, subscribers is called John. John is the son of Ari H. Corbett. Who remembers Ari H. Corbett? <laughs> you dirty old man. <laughs> you rotten old turd. <laughs> old. What? Seto and son. <clears throat> Ari H. Corbett was the most famous comedy actor in Britain in the 60s and the 70s by far. Seto and son was huge. I grew up with it. It was one of my heroes. I loved it too. And John took Craig in and helped him out and got him through a tough period. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And I'm, met, I'm meeting all you guys today. It's just amazing. I love doing these events because you guys are fucking legends. That's why I come and do things like this, because I want to meet you. Because I'm not some cock on the internet who just thinks, oh, check me out, buy my shit. I mean, yeah, I do a bit of that. <laughs> but <laughs> <clears throat> 300 quid. Um, <laughs> 45 quid. <laughs> no change given. It's a very big book, aye? It doubles up as a burglary defense weapon. And it's good for confidence. Have you never seen this book before? I've seen it, I've seen it on the screen, but I thought it was a wee book. Yeah, no, it's not. It's a fucking huge book. If I do stuff, I tend to do it large. It's quality. Pure quality. Here's a review I'd like to film. <laughs> Come over here, stand up. Let's just, ladies and gentlemen, God Wins by Mark Atwood. Come up, what's your name again? Carol. Carol. Hello, Mark, I'm a great fan of yours. But listen, I remember he said this was going to either be toilet paper toilet or paper. history, and I think it's history. It's 100%. <laughs> Historical toilet paper. Get your history. Right, this is now 100 quid. I've only got about 15 of them left. Um, they cost a fortune. You can, yeah. Because they cost a fortune to make, but I didn't want to do it on Amazon, print on demand, all that. So I just thought, I'm gonna, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it properly. And I found, a, 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 I remembered an old friend of mine pre COVID ran a print business. I rang him up and said, Do you know any printers who don't give a fuck what they print? <laughs> he went, Yeah, why? I said, I might have a job for you. <laughs> he got turned down by so many printers, you wouldn't believe it. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of this. Let's start with a bit of... This isn't a poem, right? But I'm going to start with this, because 
I, I, I wasn't planning on this, but I'll do this. Let's, let's start with it. So 2020, I, I got told, it sounds mad when I say this, but I got told by God, I was an atheist for 20 years, by the way. I'm not religious. If anybody in here thinks, oh, he's a bit of a religious, no, no I'm not. I'm an ordinary bloke. I fell out with God because my dad died of a brain hemorrhage when he was 37. I was 17 and my mum was um, trying to wake, wake him up all night, well, three days like this. Stuart, Stuart, wake up, wake up, wake up. And on the Saturday, when they, uh, they said he's, he's, he's not going to recover and your mum won't answer the question, can we turn the life support machine off? 17! I've got a 17 year old now, imagine her turning my fucking life support machine off. I'd be, what? She can't wipe her ass. <laughs> but um, I did, yeah, and I, I went to the chapel of rest, saw him laid out, came outside with a little wh bottle of whiskey, drank a bit, looked up at the sky and went, I hate you! <laughs> I'm really sorry, God. Because he didn't give up on me and he's not given up on any of us. And I'm saying he, it might be a they, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows, it swings both ways, I don't know. But he, he literally, 2020, he said, get on YouTube. I was like, fuck off, what? Yeah. I've got a business, I can't go on YouTube telling. Because you know, all the stuff I'm talking about, and I talk about in, uh, in my podcast, I've been telling people for 30 years. I've been at it for 30 years, since I left the RAF. I've been kicked out of parties, broken relationships, ended friendships, defriended by my brother in 2016 on Facebook. Why have you defriended me? I'm your brother. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. He lives in Birmingham, you might have guessed. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You're talking shite. He's had six vaccines, by the way. Yeah, and his kids and his wife. If I meet him now, I've got through the anger. I meet him now because he's my brother, I love him. But if I go out for a curry with him, we just talk about football for an hour and I haven't watched football for fucking years either. So I'm like, who's, who's doing what now? <laughs> oh, I see the Satanists at the top of the Premier League. That's good. <laughs> Followed by the Luciferians and the Masons are coming in at number four. <laughs> Marvelous. Is that Matt Letizier? Were they, were they all Satanists when you were, no. Oh. Well, they fucking are now. I mean, you see when Argentina won the World Cup, all the fucking 666 and all of that. Go and watch the illusion, the illusion. I interviewed him once. He's pretty good. Mancunian guy in Mexico. He decodes football. Unbelievable. With the numerology. Absolutely unbelievable. Where was I? Anybody paying attention? Oh, yeah. So I got told to start a YouTube channel, and I was like, fucking Really? And I, I never talk about this that much, but I took my eldest son on a road trip to Limerick, which is weird, because that's where my nan was born, but nobody ever told me she was Irish. And I didn't find out my nan was Irish until I was about 22, because they wouldn't talk about it. Because it was no blacks, no dogs, no Irish in the 50s, wasn't it? In England, anyway. Probably Scotland as well. And uh, yeah, so they were all ashamed of her Irish descent. But anyway, I was going to Limerick and it was like this nagging voice. I don't hear, I've since found out that I'm claircognizant. If you don't know, do you know what that is? You know, I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what that was. I thought that was a girl that I used to date in the 70s. <laughs> is that Claire? What do you mean you knew I was gonna ring? How cognizant of you? <laughs> I'm making this all up, did you, can you tell? Anyway, I had this thing, and, 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 and it was like, it was nag, 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 get on YouTube. I was like, fucking hell, I've like been married again. <laughs> and I got, <laughs> I got, anyway, so I got, I got my son, I said, just hold this, gave him the phone, and he said, why? I said, just point it at me, and I stood there, and I was like, my voice was all high pitched, I was like, oh, welcome to Lyric, and the man is well going. <laughs> Welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, basically, the world's run by satanic paedophiles, and every, everything you know is a lie. And please subscribe to my channel. I watched that back. I'm like, oh Jesus. There's me teaching people how to speak out on the internet. But 
it was very heightened, wasn't it, in 2020? We were all like, what the fuck is this? I remember sat in the garden going, what? No, actually, when COVID hit four years ago, I'd just given a speech in a fucking massive hotel on a beach in Mauritius in front of 600 fucking barristers. I was like outside smoking a fact going, what the, f- how the fuck did I end up here? <laughs> and then I got on this, but this is all part of the story really, because this is how God works, right? And I, you know, it was for me to see these people. And also I'd been in a massive depression. I nearly topped myself about five or six years ago, but God saved me and uh, said, no, you ain't done yet. You've got work to do. And I was like, well, what? <laughs> what? I've lost everything. What the fuck are you talking about? But anyway, he nagged me and nagged me. Oh, the, bar- the barristers, that was funny, because what happened with the barristers is that the, the, none of this worked. And I got up on stage and it wasn't working. So my PowerPoint presentation on how to use technology in law. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't make my life up, you really couldn't. I'll try, but um, as you said, yeah, it wasn't working. So I had to add lib, like I'm doing now. And I had him in stitches. And I said to the woman before, who was running it, who's now an MP in Mauritius, I said, is it all right if I swear? She went, no, you cannot swear. A lot of people say that to me, it's weird. Don't swear, <coughs> fuck off. <laughs> they said it to me in America on tour, I was in Florida, and I went to get on the stage, and this woman comes up to me and she goes, Mark, yeah? You realize you lost the Christian base, 17,000 people unsubscribed from the Rumble channel yesterday because of your cussing. Oh. I went, oh, do you care? <laughs> no. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, swearing is given to, this is why I swear in my poems, it's God given. The, the whole thing about not swearing is another limited hangout to do the mind control over us. So the reason why the swearing in some of my things is just to take ownership of the words. I'm offended. That's a microaggression. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing micro about my aggression. You cunt. So anyway, I was writing poetry I've always been a poet, right, since I was a little boy. It just floods, so only, usually only in bad circumstances. If I'm happy, I don't write any poems. <laughs> I haven't written one for about a year. But during COVID, I was like, fuck it, they're coming out. <laughs> I'm gonna shit this one out. Mm! And I did. That's why it's toilet paper. Yeah. All these poems were shut out from God. And anyway, this one is not a poem. But somebody said to me, I really like that poem that you did. And I went, which one? They went, da, da, da. I went, that's not a poem. That's me on the second bottle of wine, <laughs> 2020, thinking, I feel like doing some Derek and Clyde. Do you remember Derek and Clyde? That's, what it, that's all it was. So here it is. If you haven't seen it, here's my tribute to Derek and Clyde. There is but one word that sums them up perfectly. And that word is, when the entire governments of the world are trying to murder your fucking family. When can you use it? That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. 
So anyway, that's not, um, not really a poem, but um, is this working? <laughs> is this working? Is this working? Oh, that's better. See? It's fucking genius poetry. Can't, can't, get 27 pages. 27 pages of country. My dentist has this in her reception. And I, I'm gonna go and see her next week. I went around six months ago. I said, you really put in that in your reception? She goes, it's the best fucking conversation starter ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, was, I was pretty pleased with that. But, but the poems just come out, right? And what I realized is, oh fuck, this is real. God's real. Oi, shut up. <laughs> just because you gave me a nice review. <laughs> it's out of this world. You're all right, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, but publishing stuff like this is, I think it's important because, it, you know, there's thousands of these in living rooms all over the world and in places, and it does start conversations because people have to consume information in different ways, don't they? You know, you watch a video, it's very different to when you read something or you listen to something, you know, something physical. The other thing is, I've been teaching the law of attraction for years. And one of the things I teach is, or I used to teach, <coughs> excuse me, is that you have to write things down to make them exist in this hologram that we call life, right? So putting the words down is powerful. And I've tried to inspire other people to write and make music and do poems and do jokes and get on stage and get online and do that because we are incredibly powerful. Why do you think they go to all these lengths to kill us? Hmm? We're, very, we're like cockroaches, aren't we? Very hard to kill. <laughs> you know, I've been trying for years. Smoking and drinking my way to the early grave, I'm still fucking here. <laughs> I don't know. But I got the call and uh, I was like, hello? Oh, it's God here. <laughs> yeah? Are you busy? <laughs> uh, no, not at the moment. Uh, could you write some poems for me? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Uh, no, that'll do for now. So I was like, okay. So I just shut them out. But the amazing thing was, when the poems came out, I, I knew I had to make them into videos. So I was shitting them, literally shitting them out. I was like, come on, I'm gonna get this online now. That's why there's spelling mistakes in them. Just letting you know. That's the reason. But I, I wanted to write um, something about the time in 2020. And I was given this poem, and this is what, what I'm trying to get across in this rambling chat tonight, is that everything in your life has a meaning. The Egyptian thing out there is not there by accident, all right? And what happened to me in 2020 is I was having all these flashbacks to moments in my life and all the things that I'd done. And it was like, oh, it all makes sense now. That's why I was a journalist at the Daily Telegraph, so I could see Max Hatings, the editor, that satanic cunt, face to face, and how they lie in the media. Because I did. I was there when Lockerbie happened. I was working at the Telegraph. How? How? Because I was being groomed by the deputy features editor, who'd come to Manchester, saw me as a student in the bar, fancied me, and offered me a fucking job. So I went to London and worked at the Daily Telegraph. Didn't realize I was being groomed. Of course, I was too innocent. I'm a country boy. And I like girls, so, uh, you know, wasn't happening, David. I don't care how many drinks you buy me, I'm not getting in that cab with you. Ever. So that's what happened. So I was at the Daily Telegraph, and I was like, how do, you know, I saw them, I saw how they manipulated everything. And I was in the back of the cab with a journalist one night who was straight, so this was okay. And he was hammered. And I said, why are you working at the Daily Telegraph? You were like the editor of the Plymouth or an Argyle Post or something. And he said, well, I'm, and he was crying his eyes out because he'd, he'd lost his family. He was getting divorced because he was drinking so much and he was in London and he'd left his family behind. And I said, why? Why didn't you stay with your family? You didn't be a big fish in a small pond. Why did you come here? He said, because they pay me 180 grand a year. This is in 1988. And I was like, fuck. You know, so you get all these signs in your life, don't you? You know, I was in comedy for years and I saw people become really famous who were rubbish. And I was like, how did, they, how did that happen? And, and be, basically, people make soul contracts. And they do sign their way their soul. God is real, by the way, and so is Satan. Um, I've met him three times. Might go into that. But um, 
yeah, anyway, so back in my <laughs> earlier life, my mum, have you all seen my mum or yes. met my mum? Yes. Some of you came to Birmingham and met her, didn't you? Put your hands yes. up. Yeah. She's lovely, isn't she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's just a ball of love, right? Um, a simple woman, but a ball of love. And she, she was working three jobs when I was a kid. She was the postwoman, she was looking after some old people, and she was the cleaner at the big posh house in the village, which was owned by Mrs. Haygate. In my village, it's famous for two things. Firstly, Mrs. Haygate, the Haygate Mills, which you'll see, if you go down south, you'll see uh, what, what kind of fair lady flower or something. That's where I saw Thatcher have eggs thrown at her car in 1980, which was nice childhood memory. But um, Michael Thatcher, where there is discord, may we bring harmony. <laughs> Fucking bloke, I'm telling you, that's a bloke. Um, yeah, of course she is. They're all fucking Satanists. All of them. Anyway, I went round after school to Mrs. Haygate's and it was all mega posh. And she had a big, long wheelbase Jaguar. I think that's why I've got one now, because I was like, wow, it's an amazing car. It saved her life. That's another story. But she would teach me things like uh, where the knives and forks go and stuff like that. And she gave me, one day she gave me this poem, If, by Rudyard Kipling. Um, I know he was a mason, but what an amazing poem. So this is one I wrote. The first thing I did was this one. And I'm only showing you these because you might not have seen them. And this, is, uh, this was filmed in the woods next to my house in Ireland. If you can keep your head when all about you are wearing masks and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when your neighbors doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait for the lockdown to be over or stop believing in government lies, don't deal in lies or being hated for posting truth on Facebook and use your intuition to get wise. If you can dream the golden age to come here faster. If you can think for yourself, but not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with Trump and avoid disaster and treat those two just the same. If you can bear to be called a conspiracy theorist, a CIA term to make a trap for fools, or watch long-held beliefs become absurdist and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap from all your crypto and get some gold and not give a toss and lose your debts and start a new beginning and never breathe a word about it to your boss. If you can force your nerves and courage to speak your voice when it seems they're gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the strength to face the dawn. If you can talk on YouTube and keep your virtue or speak your truth without losing the common touch, if neither trolls nor loving friends can hurt you, if all followers count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minutes with 60 seconds worth of meditation in 5D, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a multi-dimensional being. You'll see. Thank you. Um, you know, all, all of these poems are, are encoded, and I tried to put information in about what was going on and uh, what we really are and what's happening. I think I was too subtle, right? Because the people needed to shove it in their faces. I mean, I went, somebody said to me the other day, oh, yeah, yeah, I love your work and everything. I said, oh, did you see that? No, no I've never seen that. Did, oh. To, and you can't reach everybody, but what happens is with the information that you put out in this, in this mission that I'm on, is that I realise that it's all frequency matching. So people get attracted to the because we're just frequency, right? In, free, in fact, I'll prove it. I want you to just close your eyes for a second and think about how you feel right now. Just kind of make a mental note of how you feel, and then I'm going to 
I'm going to teach you a technique which I have found so powerful and useful over the years to help me reset my frequency that was taught to me by, I um, can't remember his name now, John C. Parkin who was actually my first ever podcast guest, but in a podcast that I tried to launch in 2014, but I never launched it. An amazing guy. In order to, so you've made a mental note of how you feel, and then you're going to do something for me, and what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to let go, which is a Taoist principle, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. In fact, when I was, being, when I was in my depression, suicidal stage, what I, what I was being told by God was you're going to have to let everything go. Go and live in a tent, for example. Right? Because we've had to let go of every single idea about the world that we've ever had, haven't we? And, and God said, I, I went, really, let go? I was putting out memes about letting go 10 years ago, but I didn't really understand how deep he meant. And I said, what, really let go of everything? He said, yep. I went, what, my children? Yep. What? I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, but I, it was God, so I knew it was serious. It wasn't somebody fucking about, was it? Um, so this technique is called fuck it therapy. And the way that you do it is you stand on your feet, please, everybody, if you can. Get on your feet. And what you do is you just start shaking your hands and then your legs and your knees and really start shouting, and then start bouncing on your, the balls of your feet. This, you can do this at home, it's perfectly safe, unless you've got neighbours who don't like you very much. <laughs> and you just keep shaking, shaking, really shake, really shake, and then after three, I'm going to shout, fuck it, at the top of my voice, and you're going to join in. Ready? One, two, three, fuck it! <laughs> and again, one, two, three, fuck it! Sit down. <laughs> How do you feel now? <laughs> you feel good, don't you? Yeah. It's a great way of resetting your energy. You can do it any time. Go and read John C. Parkin's books, Fuck It Therapy. It's fantastic stuff. I did, I did that at a business seminar, I think in about 2015. And there was a woman in the audience who worked for the government, and when after I did that, she fucked off. Because <coughs> they're not fucking human, are they? What are they? What are they? Does anybody know? Lizards. Close. Cunts, yes. What the fuck are they? How many, how many, all of you, right? You've all lost friends and family, right? That you thought were good mates. You thought they loved you. Wrong. They think you're mad. What? They think we're mad. Well, if they saw this video, they're probably right. I don't know. You want to what? They're all on tape. They're all on, yes. We know where you live. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it's just mind-blowing, isn't it? I walked into a garage. I was driving to the protest in Dublin, and, I, and this is where I learned a very big lesson about your energy and your frequency. I was, not, I was out of sorts. I was running late. I had a hangover. And I stopped in the garage, get a coffee on the way to Dublin. And I walked in, and they were all walking around. Oh. This old man looked at me, and I just walked in, went to the coffee, and he was like, "What's the mask? What's the mask? What's the mask? He's not wearing a mask." I was like, "Fucking what?" I was like, "Don't fucking shout at me!" I was, you know, not not quite with it. You know, don't fucking shout at me! You cunt! What the fuck? I'm getting a coffee. Where's your mask? What thing doesn't work? Have you read the fucking label? Where's your mask? He's not wearing. Got the coffee, paid. Went out and I was shaking like that. I was like, fucking hell, this is really weird. What? What the, what, the, what? What? 
But anyway, um, but energy. So I was being taught about energy and frequency. And I think we've all learned a lot about that, haven't we? Yeah? I know lots of people have been teaching this stuff for years and, you know, running classes in Tibet or whatever, but I wasn't really paying attention that much, really. I was too busy with the mortgage and the children being busy, like most of us, right? But even coming to Edinburgh last night, <coughs> we got here about 7 p.m. I was meeting up with some of you lovely people for dinner, and I was sat in the car, and it was amazing, this guy just started running up to me and screaming at me, going, yeah, you there, you get by, you come out there, I'm gonna call the police. It was in a Polish accent, I think, I couldn't replicate it. And I was going, oi, don't, you don't need to shout at me, what are you shouting for? I'm just sat in the car. And the interesting thing was, he was screaming at me, but he was backing away from me at the same time. So he was scared of me. And you know, I've come to know what this is. It's entities, yeah. right? They come at you in, so they're, they're fuckers. They come at you in ways that you never expected. They come through your friends and family. They possess them. <coughs> they whisper in their ear. And I knew as soon as we got here, they didn't want me here, right? And even today, we went to Rosalind Chapel, right? I was supposed to do an event. I've, got, I've pulled a muscle doing that, hang on. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. It's, good. it's not a joke, it hurts. Um, <laughs> you're laughing at my pain. Hey. <laughs> no, I was supposed to do an event at Rosalind Chapel with Michael Feely, who's been on my channel, who knows Tons of stuff, tons of esoteric knowledge. And um, he rang me up and he said, it's been canceled. And I was like, why has it been canceled? He said, well, the people at Rosalind Chapel found out it was you and me and they canceled it and they won't let us in. Anyway, rocked up there today, quarter to three, guy comes straight outside and he had weird eyes. He said, uh, sorry, you can't come in, you can't come in because uh, there's, a, there's a power uh, thing happening at three o'clock and uh, there's no time. And we're like, well, we just want to pop in and out. No, 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 you couldn't possibly come in. Come in. Wouldn't let us in. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, you could call me, um, I don't know, paranoid, but I've just seen too much of this. I know, I knew what was going on. There's something going on that they don't want me to connect with. <coughs> so what is that? It's interesting, isn't it? So I did a little video about this today because so many strange things have happened like that. So I'll just give you some of the edited highlights of some of the strange things that have happened to me over the last four years. And the reason I share these is because I've learnt from when I did my first show with Charlie Ward, and I, talk, I didn't know what I was gonna talk about then, and I ended up talking about demons coming to visit me in my bedroom in 1973 when I was a little boy. And they were trying to recruit me. They were like, you're gonna come with us, you get everything you want. And I was like four, I was like, no thanks. And he came every single fucking night. It was really boring, actually. Because um, I've never been afraid of them. <coughs> in fact, that was during the miners' strike. Does anybody remember the miners' strike? In, yeah? My mum brought in this little tea light, co-op tea light, to, when the lights were out, and put it next to my bed here. And the bedroom wall was here. And I, my bed was here. And I remember sitting up one night, and the, the candle was casting a shadow over this wall, like a normal shadow. But there was another shadow on that wall. And it had horns on. I'm not joking. I never told anybody this, because you've kind of put these things in a box, don't you? As you grow up and you, you know, you don't get on stage to tell people this weird shit. And I was doing this, trying to rub the horns off, lying up and down. It was copying everything I was doing. But it was perfectly black. And it was perfectly outlined. And that was like, you know, start of my life. In fact, they know who all of us are. They've known since before you were born because you are all points of light. You're all carrying frequencies and codes that are changing and saving this world. That's why I come to meet people like you because you are all heroes. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, right? You've got to believe in what you're here to do. <coughs> and just by being here, you're doing it. You don't have to go on YouTube. You don't have to do all that crap. You just, just be you and uh, love 
everybody, because love is the answer, right? Um, where was I? You keeping up? I'm in a bit of pain here, so. I'm... No, I forgot it. Oh, the horns, yeah. So, yeah, so I went on, yeah, that's right, that's right. So I went on the Charlie Ward show, and I started telling people this, and then it was so funny how that happened. The only reason I got on that show is because I'd been on his, I'd seen him talking positively about what was going on, and he was the only one that I could see at the time doing that. So I thought, this guy's interesting. And I went to his Facebook page, and the, the figures were going through the roof. It was like 50, 10,000, 100,000. I was like, fucking hell, this is huge what's going on here and I did a post and people were posting in 2020 they were like what's going on are we gonna die is it what's going on are we gonna die and I put this I wrote a post and I, and I said look this is my story um, we're not all gonna die and actually it's gonna turn out really well <laughs> in the middle of the fucking lockdowns right because I just know it's gonna be fine that's why I call myself an apocaloptimist <laughs> apocalypse is the great unveiling in Greek, optimist, you know what that is, somebody can't see very well. <laughs> oh no, that's an optometrist, sorry. Um, so I wrote this post, and it went viral, it had like 100,000 views in a couple of days, and the guy that was running things for Charlie got in touch and said, you need to come on the show, and I was like, okay. And then it got delayed, so he's, I think his YouTube channel had about 5,000 people when I got invited on. And then for some reason it got delayed. 20,000 people, delayed. 50,000 people, delayed. By the time I got on his show, 80,000 people watched me talk about fucking demons online. <laughs> I was literally, fuck, I'm ruined. I thought my business clients would see this and go, right, we're not working with you anymore. <laughs> you might be an internet marketing genius who's made us millions, but fuck off talking about demons, that's too far. <laughs> And that didn't happen, it did eventually, but it didn't happen immediately, because I was being looked after from above, financially, so that I could do what I've been doing. Um, <clears throat> but I got all these emails from people saying, thank you so much for talking about that, because the same thing happened to me when I was a kid, and I've never told anybody. And I was like, oh, maybe that, because I, I, that Christmas in 2020, I, I didn't do any videos for a couple of weeks, and I sat there thinking, why am I doing this? And then, it, then it started, I started to realise it was about, I think, what my job was to not wake people up, to speak to the people that were already awake and let them know they weren't on their own and they weren't the only ones who were considered nutters by everybody else in society. And thank you. And, you know, touring America and meeting thousands of people of that, I think I, do, I, think I actually did quite well, and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it. And the poetry was part of this. Because we, we have to face what we're, you know, people don't understand, we've got an invisible enemy, okay? I mean, some people can see it, but, you know, mainly it's invisible, isn't it? So, you know, we can't beat them up, we can't shoot them. Well, we could, but it wouldn't end well, would it? And I, I've not got a gun, so. <laughs> I was thinking, what can I do? I know, I'll write some poems. That'll fuck them up. <laughs> Turns out I was right. Um, so, yeah, and, the, and, and, the, and you know, the, these poems, I didn't think I was coming here to talk about the poems, but it's nice to talk about them, actually, because they're like my babies, and I'm proud of them. And they, they kind of ended up narrating the whole period, which is weird. So I'm going to play this one, which is called God Wins. <laughs> Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Fifteen days to flatten the curve. The invisible enemy, you've got a nerve. Don't go to work, take a break. Get some free money. Shut up and eat cake. Bread and circuses, that's what she said. I get the feeling she wanted us dead. Wanted us in the ICU. Yes, I do mean you, and you, and you. Get them hooked up to a ventilator. Kills them quick. See you later. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Masks are good. Masks are bad. I can tell by your eyes. 
you're looking sad. Madonna's singing about fried fucking fish. Prince has put Cappy in a petri dish. Alan Degenerate going mad in his pad. Let's talk about Michelle. You know, there's a picture. <laughs> stay in, stay in, or you're gonna die. COVID-19 is the porky pie. That's what we call the theatre of war. Don't question us, it's the fucking law. Sick of it yet? We've just begun. JFK Jr., the forgotten son. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Bill Melinda and Dr. Death. Needles everywhere till there's none of us left. Vaccination, eradication, extermination. Go to 17 for your education. Hubba, 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 who do you trust? Maybe the dams are gonna bust. <coughs> Underground bases, dum dum dums. Secret operations, cleaning the scum. 22,000 kids every day. Believe it or not, you need to pray. Welcome to the nightmare, the new world order. Hidden in bushes, mental disorders. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. Lockdown, shutdown, breakdown. 3D, 5D, reality tears. Attack of the clones in basements everywhere. Vatican gone, Parliament gone, God save the Queen, time for a new song. Through the looking glass, the quantum system grins. I've got some non-fake news for you. God wins. Yeah. I mean, if he doesn't, we're fucked, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah these these poems started going out and um and then i just started you know and it's so important that we share stories because that's all we are isn't it we're stories um i'd recommend everybody goes to read uh, the hero with a thousand faces joseph campbell have you all read that it's all about the hero's journey uh the all the stories in history that resonate are the hero's journey including your own life and every cell in your body is following the hero's journey. And so is the universe on a macro scale. You've heard of the 26,000 year cycle? That's what we're at the end of at the moment. It's a hero's journey. The hero's journey actually made me a West End director, would you believe? Yeah, there was a comedian, <coughs> a friend of mine called Toby and um, he's got a posh voice and he, he says, I've written a new show. I said, what's it called? He said, Doc, called her mobile phone. <laughs> he said, no, it's called Moths Ain't My Doctor Who Scarf. And I was like, fucking brilliant, let's do it, because we're both Doctor Who fans. And I was like, let's do it. And he did this three hour long rambling thing and I cut it down to 45 minutes uh, and used the hero's journey and brought it to Edinburgh, actually. And it sold out and then it toured the world. And it got made into a BBC play and it ended up at the West End. I'm like, fuck me, I'm a West End director. How did I do that? <laughs> but it was all because of the hero's journey. And we all need to look into that because it's, it's extremely powerful to understand that that's where we're at. Because when you know what the enemy is and you know who you really are, how do you feel? Empowered, right? Because what have they been doing since we were born? Taking our power away. Or making it look as if our power has been taken away. And you know, that's why sovereignty is so important we need well, what are we all learning in the last four years is how to be completely as much as possible responsible for our own thoughts emotions spirituality health because it's all here you know we have that we have everything that we need in front of us and we don't we didn't realize that and that's why i set up a healing center in the west of ireland last year because i kept meeting people going I'm going to open a healing centre worldwide. I said, how are you going to do that? Well, the RV's coming next week. We're going to have billions. I met a bloke and he said, there's billions in the bank and they're going to give it to us next week. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Have you ever run a business? No. Do you think they're going to give you billions of dollars? Yeah. Why? Why do you think that? It's a cult. The RV is a cult. Look at it, look at the behavior of people that believe in it. Could happen, be great if it did. And I'll hold my hands up and go, do you know what, all you cultists, brilliant, well done. We can all relax, because you're in charge now. <coughs> it 
If you ever have anybody sort of gets dogmatic or has these beliefs, run a fucking mile, right? I've got a major problem with cults because the second thing my village was famous for was a cult called the Jesus Army. Ever heard of that? Yeah? Well, you have. Were you in it? Were you? You were? Where? In Northampton? No, in a different place. Okay. What was the founder of the Jesus Army called? It was a man called Noel Stanton. He was a lay preacher in my village church in the 50s, and he raped my dad when he was a choir boy. Yeah. I didn't find that out until about 10 years ago, because my dad told a very different version of that story. So this, <clears throat> this cult was called the Jesus Fellowship in the 60s, and it grew up around me, and they were just going to London, getting drug addicts, bringing them up to Northampton, putting them into my village, taking over, they were buying all the houses, buying all the land. God was showing me what a cult is. I mean, it's very personal for me, this whole thing about stopping the rape and murder of children, because that's what this is all about. 22,000 kids every day, I said in that video. That's over a billion children since the Second World War. Do you want to live in that world? I fucking don't. If anybody touched my kids, I would fucking murder them. But they're all our kids. And that 22,000 figure is actually an official statistic. That doesn't take into account the ones that they grow the ones that they breed underground. The whole world is one great big child trafficking adrenochrome machine. The reason I put the evergreen in that video, why did I put that in there? Anybody know? That's how they traffic the children. The deep underground bases, dum dum dums, deep underground military bases. They're all over the world. 1,400, I think, Evergreen Containers. And, what, and whose nickname, whose, whose code name was Evergreen? Hello. You're a great crowd, <laughs> top of the class. Evergreen was Hillary Clinton's code name. I personally believe she was executed along with all of them. And we're watching the play out. We're watching a sting operation. And I've known that since the beginning. But it's a spiritual war, right? It's not a 3D war, it's a spiritual war. So some of the weird things that have happened to me when I started waking up, I said that I left the RAF. I'll tell you this story if you've never heard it before. So I was a little council house kid who looked out the window one day, saw a Harriet and said, I'm gonna fly one of them. And then my maths teacher threw a board rubber at my head. <laughs> Sorry, miss. Just dreaming about flying and getting out of this fucking weird village. I mean, it was, it was more than metaphorical. And the interesting thing about the Jesus Army, by the way, is that just before COVID, they had to close down operations because the sheer volume of paedophile law cases against them. All of my friends, Darren, who used to sit next to me in maths, he was being fucking raped as a kid. You know, but why is the Catholic Church? It's one great, big, fucking huge paedophile cult, isn't it? Yeah, cults. Beware of cults. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, watching an airplane. So, so I, said, I, said to my, I actually said to my careers teacher when I was 15, uh, he said, right, he had a clipboard and he went, this is how they do the mind control bullshit, because most people will follow what they tell you to do. I never, ever followed what anybody ever told me to do. My nickname in school was Trouble. <laughs> and I've been Trouble ever since, because it's the best way to live, right? And I said to my career student, you said, there's a factory down the road, it'd be perfect for you. I went, fuck. I said, fuck off. <laughs> well, I didn't. I went, really, sir? I'm not interested. He went, why not? I said, because I'm going to be a pilot. He went, <laughs> anyway, this factory. And I, was, I looked at him and I was like, you fucking wanker. How do you take away the dreams of children? And that's what they do, that's what they do to everybody. You know, I tell my kids, you probably know this if you watch my channel, but I tell my kids, every time I drop them off at school, 
By the way, they had four years of homeschooling. I did set up a school in Marrakesh, but that's another story. When I got back to Ireland, split up for my wife, five kids. <coughs> they wanted to go to school, they wanted to socialize, so I let them. It was always their decision, but whenever I dropped them off, I say this every single time I drop them off. I say, have a lovely day in prison. Because <laughs> that's what it is. Question everything, including this. And remember, everything they're teaching you is bullshit and you're gonna have to unlearn it. <laughs> if anybody could get me some water, that'd be great. Um, and it's working. My 17 year old son in 2021 came home with a mask on in his car, I picked him up. And I said, you look depressed. And he was telling me, oh, copper, lovely. Thank you very much. Good man. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Copper, another thing they took away from us. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. In fact, I'm just going to get you this. This is something I think you'd all like, actually. Um, this, is, this, is, this contains the best water in the world. It's called grander water. And if you pop it in, it transfers the information from that water to whatever's next to it, which is why I wear it in my pocket all the time, because we are water, right? Uh, so I was telling you a story, where was I? Flying. Flying, flying. flying. yeah, sorry, yeah. So I could fly before I could drive, because I joined the Air Cadets, and I, you know, I got a scholarship, and then I got the highest grade they'd given to any pilot in the RAF in 22 years. And that's the day I knew I could leave. And the reason I knew I could leave that day is because firstly, they'd covered up the suicides of two of my friends. Secondly, Thatcher was lying about nuclear weapons in the papers. I got into the officer's mess in Germany one day and there was the Daily Telegraph. Margaret Thatcher says, blah, 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 blah. No nuclear weapons, not in the UK. And I was flying over a nuclear silo every day and I was like, hang on, that's a lie to us fuck <laughs> I couldn't believe it because at that point I was queen and country god bless them I used to run home to watch question time <laughs> I thought I was keeping up to date with current affairs I didn't realize I was looking looking at six fucking pedophiles lying through their teeth because that's oh, thank you so much Matthew yeah. thank you and, uh, you know, at the end of Question Time on the BBC, they used to play the National Anthem. Nobody else in the room? Me? Yeah. God save our gracious Queen. Oh. Oh. Oh, my God. When you know the truth about them. So, again, God put me in interesting positions. And I remember... I got the gold Duke of Edinburgh's award. Edinburgh. Because he's so Scottish, wasn't he? The Greek <laughs> Nazi. <laughs> and um, because my dad had died, I, I delayed going to fetch the award from London. And I think I was 18 or 19, and I went with my mum. She put her best gear on. And I put my RAF uniform on. And I went to St. James's Palace. And I met David Kirk, the um, All Blacks captain, had a lovely chat with him. And I was like, there was loads of amazing teenagers there that had all got the Gold Duke of Edinburgh's award, which is a fantastic award. You know, what you do to get it is actually fucking brilliant, right? Part of their cover story, that's how they do it. And I was stood there, proud as punch. And Prince Philip is about this big on me. Most people think he's like that, he was really like that. And I'm not exactly tall, right? So he's like that. And he must have been 70 then. And he's walking down and he's shaking hands and he shakes my hand. And he looks at and I'm looking at him going, he looks really fucking weird. He's like leather skin and these really strange eyes. And it's just wrong, he was wrong. And I was like a bit freaked out to be honest, but I was standing to attention because he's the commander in chief, right? He's the head of the RAF. He's the head of a fucking army, he's the head of everything. It's the Queen's Commission. And he's boning the Queen, so he's pretty high up, right? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. 
Turns out he wasn't boning her at all. He was boning everything Jimmy Savile brought to the fucking front door. Anyway, I'm stood there and he's, he's shaking my hand and he's looking at me and he's looking at the uniform and he goes, I see you've joined the, uh, the, uh, the, and then his aide goes, Royal Air Force, sir. And in my head, I'm going, what? You don't recognize this uniform? What the fuck? You're the boss. He'd probably just come up from the fucking dungeons, right? High on adrenochrome. But at that point, I was like, and I did this, I'm very proud of this. And I sarcastically went, that's right, sir. And he whipped his hand away, gave me the filthiest look. And I could still feel his hand now. And he moved on. And I remember driving home with my mum going, who am I working for? What, who are, what? I'm, I've spent all this time being proud, polishing my boots, beating the Paris and their own assault course. I was unbelievably fit. I got these incredibly high grades in everything. And suddenly, it's like finding out your dad's a pedo or something, isn't it? It's just like, I believed in you. And so this is where my kind of letting go started personally. And I'm only sharing it because you, all, you, you will all have a moment in your life when you go, that's when it started, for me too. So I started to wake up then. And then loads of just really weird things happened, like 9-11. Uh, On 9-11, my friend, my best friend, Matt Campbell, his younger brother, uh, Jeff, was in the towers and died that day. And I was friends with Jeff as well, but I was bigger friends with Matt. And over the next 20 years, Matt has tried to uncover the truth about this, and I've sat over his shoulder throughout this process. So this was all part of my own conspiracy research, if you like, firsthand at the front door. It even ended up with me getting invited to a trial at Gitmo in 2016, which I was going to go to, but then my wife at the time stopped me. She said, you're not going to that because you've got five kids. And I went, OK, fair play. I wish I had gone, but... And that was strange as well, because he got flown from London to Washington, and then from Washington down to Guantanamo Bay, going over the Gulf of Mexico. And when he went there, they narrowly avoided a hurricane called Hurricane Matthew. Oh, they were trying to, they, were, they would have killed him. To, you know they can control the weather, right? That's not news to you, is it? And if you go on your phones and go to Google and type in Hurricane Matthew, do it now. Go on, go on Google Images, Hurricane Matthew, and have a look at what's there. In fact, I could do it here, can't I? I forgot that I'm actually presenting. <laughs> I thought I was just down the pub having a chat. <laughs> Is that the face of a demon or what? That is the face of a demon. Do you believe that demons can live in the sky? Yes, they do. It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> Too much information, Mark. <laughs> At least I haven't found the Bob joke. I've got to keep it clean ish. Um, I actually can't help myself because I just get this naughty voice in my head goes, God, this is my Bob joke. <laughs> but that's, that's part of this, right? Because demons hate laughter. They hate it, they can't latch onto it. And they can't latch onto. If your blood's clean, they can't latch onto it. But I think it's kind of technology. You know, that's why a lot of stuff I've been talking about is about cleaning your blood, structured water, salt. They'd like to smell salt. If you drink water without proper salt in it, you're actually dehydrating yourself. But, you know, that's the great thing about interviewing all the people I've interviewed. I've learned so much. That's why I want to make the easy. I'll come back to that in a minute. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, no, no, no. Poor Jeff. I think the Campbell family, um, it was 10 years later they got a piece of collarbone that big. That's the only bit they got left with Jeff. And, um, but it, what really got me uh, back then is that firstly, I was in hospital with a suspected heart attack. I was in the ICU when 9 11 happened. Because I'd been to this wedding in Spain and I'd swum in the sea and I'd exerted myself. And my friend who was a doctor said, You need to go to the hospital. Like a doctor. I didn't sit to him. It was my next wedding. I said, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go with a cigar on this arm, brandy on this arm. So fuck that. 
But I ended up going to hospital. <coughs> and my girlfriend at the time came in, in, uh, in the hospital. The, the, the lad that was next to me, he was about 17, I think he was. He died overnight. I said to the nurse that night before, I said, I'm not going to die. And she went, mm. It's not looking good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Where did you learn your bedside manner? <laughs> the Fauci School of Medicine. <laughs> so I, it was a pretty rough night. And I woke up. I said, what's been going on? And she said, oh, two planes have just crashed into the World Trade Center. So I went, what? And I got out of bed and I saw what was going on. And I could feel it. This is the whole point. What I'm trying to get across with all of this is that I could feel it. But I just didn't know what I was feeling. Because I couldn't. I hadn't calibrated, I hadn't worked out what was really going on spiritually. But it was a massive, massive spiritual event. We all remember it. Well, most of us are all to remember it. Most people still don't know about the three periods. What? They don't know about Trade Center 7. Um, so, what really got me going then, and this is part of the acceleration of my own awakening, is Matt came back and I was like, you know, he made me godfather to one of his kids. We bought a racehorse called Jeff Star so we could all get together and remember Jeff because they loved the horse racing. We got together. And during these conversations, he started telling me stuff. He said he met Clinton and he met Bush, shook their hands, and, and Tony Blair, of course. Education, education, oh. education, <laughs> indoctrination. <laughs> My real name has been around. <laughs> yes, I was done for Potter Jake. But I'm a fucking great prime minister. No, you're not. You're a mass murdering faggot. Fuck off. <laughs> oh, I hate that. Um, I hate all. I think you might be able to tell that some of my work. But he said that the family was given a contract this thick to sign two weeks after nine months. That contract would have taken years to write. Hello, a fly. <laughs> And then they all got given a million dollars. Every family got given a million dollars right there. If you sign this contract, a million dollars. What would you do? If you're in shock, you just lost a loved one, you're in New York, been there for two weeks, looking, waiting for news about your loved one. Sign this, here's a million dollars. You you know, you wouldn't even read it properly, would you? And that was like, okay. And then one of the women that would refused, right? She refused to sign it. Her husband had died. I can't remember her name on the phone. But she died in a plane. They killed 200 people just to prove her. Over New York. Right? So 9-11, despite being a horrific event, also helped wake up millions of people. And that is what COVID has done. And we're all wise to this now, everyone in this room. But the question is, where do we go from here? And what do we do with all this knowledge? Because one of the questions I keep getting from the time back into 2016, 2017, is like, well, if it's all true what you say, well, what are we going to do about it? And I'd answer back, uh, sort your food out, love everybody, meditate. And they'd be like, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, well, yeah. I know. <laughs> but it's like, with the, um, that's what I was saying about the RV and how I get annoyed with people who think that the, the RV is going to happen tomorrow. And if there's anybody in this room, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just saying, come on, get rid of this. Oh, sorry, it's the revaluation of currency. There's a lot of people that, that believe that this, there, there is a new financial system coming, no question. We are moving into a golden age, no question. My problem is, what are we doing about it now? What have we got in front of us? Now. People are dying. Now. And it's the same with the med beds. Sounds fabulous, doesn't it? Med beds. I'm just waiting for the med beds. I'm not even waiting. What are you what? You're waiting for the med beds. Have you ever seen a med bed? Has anybody in this room ever seen a med bed? Please put your hand up and tell me you've seen a med bed. See? And you're all awake. So I was like, look. Med beds sound fabulous, but people are dying now. What are we going to do about it? So I opened a healing centre in the west of Ireland using hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Because oxygen is the bridge. You can't... I say you can't help with oxygen, but there's something to fucking do. 
I'm like, it, what's that thing you got there? It's uh, oxygen. What's that? <laughs> it's what you're breathing now. <laughs> well, what does he do? <laughs> Keeps you alive. Do you want to get in the chamber? I don't know. I have to speak to my doctor about that oxygen. So I'm not even sure. I mean, six is like that. It's bad. <laughs> It's not this is like you think months stop fucking viruses that don't exist. And then it's just unbelievable. But I, I knew it was very important to create a bridge. Because what I realized also from studying Dolores Cannon is that people who wake now in their fifties are bridges. Did you know that? And she was getting all that information from the hypnotherapy work she was doing in the sixties and seventies when she realized that lots of people under hypnosis were saying the same stuff, even though they'd never met. So she put it out there, and she realised there's waves of souls that have come in. People in the night from now, I think they're the scouts. I can't remember the important words, you probably don't know what me, but people in their 50s is a bridge. So we're part healer, part warrior. Now, if you told me I was going to be a healer, I'd, be, I'd laughed at you. All right, I'm not on the business, but I don't heal people. But actually, when I look back in my life, I've been healing people my whole fucking life. just didn't realise it. You know, I was business consultant for years, and people would come and say, my business is not working. And after a few hours, I'd realise it was because they were not in a happy marriage, they, their parents told them they were shit when they were kids, so I don't know, they counselling them, because that's the reason why most people are not successful, because they've been brainwashed into thinking they can't be. So I brainwashed them the other way, uh, before COVID, that's what I did for a living. So, where was I? You know, you're on top. <laughs> Did you enjoy this? It's, it's okay. Yeah. A lot of what? The Lord's Cannon, yes. So we're bridges. And um, so I said to my, I had this friend, a, lot of, a complete serendipity, a guy moved to the same town as me. I had to move to Ireland, by the way, in 2017. No idea why. And then I realised, oh, and that's like another long story, but um, everybody's exactly where they needed to be. We were all put into position when COVID hit, because you're carrying white coats, you're carrying a free PC, and that's how we have won this war, right? But with, with the heart bit, we've got to sit and watch it play out. There's a story who's been uh, to the same town as me at the same time, who's awake, and he's a crypto trader, because his business has wiped out by the last, whatever, he was trading crypto, and he was doing really well, and I was like, this is very interesting. And I said to him, Gary, we need to open a healing centre now, and he said, I agree, we'll use oxygen as the bridge, because that, it, everybody's welcome. And we make it donation base. It's donation base. Look, you do this in London, it's going to cost you 150 quid. We're in the Western Island. If you can afford 80 euros, great. If you can't afford it, it's free. Or just pay what you can afford. Even that, they don't understand. There's <laughs> a guy in the cafe I've seen every week, and we go, oh, guys, tell me back problem. I was like, well, go and you'll have a barrack auction, and we'll fix it quicker. He said, ah, geez, the cafe. <laughs> it, it's donation based. I can't afford it. <laughs> it's free if you can't afford it. <laughs> no, I can't afford it. <laughs> it took me six weeks to convince him to go in. <laughs> and he did. He looks amazing now. And he's healed. Right? And the first thing we get, we do when people come in, is so what water are you drinking? You know, wet stuff out of the tank. <laughs> Yeah, that they've been fucking our water so badly, and it's so simple. You change, you heal, you heal people immediately just with water, oxygen. Now we've got red light bed coming in. We've got, um, we had an event uh, a month ago, and we've had 556 franchise inquiries to open the same healing centre. We've got four probably going to open up in the next three months. So one in Canada, one in America, two in the UK. And there's 500 people behind them that want to do it. We're going to take their franchise money. We're going to call it licensing. We're going to take their fee. We're going to massively multiply the uh, money um, using crypto trading because my friend Gary is an expert at this and he's 100 exited money three times. So if we can get 3 billion quid in the bank, that becomes 300 million quid, which means we're going to the fucking hospital. But one that's based on holistic stuff that looks after people that doesn't tell people they're going to die overnight. Or inject them with poison. Or do satanic rituals at birth to separate the children's souls from them. Because that's what they did. So, you know, it's... I mean, we have this event. 
for people that were serious about the franchise. And there's a guy who came along called Peter Wilson. Peter Wilson runs um, Claim Your Sulfur, Claim Your Strawman.com. Great guy in Shrewd Castle. I've had him on the show a few times. He's talking loads of stuff. He helped me get rid of a £200,000 tax bill using this knowledge, right? It's natural law. We all need to get up to speak on that sort of common law. There's a lot of arguments about which bits work, which bits don't. But the thing is, we have the power. We have to do the whole he, he said, he was so inspired. He said, I, he said, I've been teaching people about this for four years. You're the only ones that have done it, actually done it. And we set it up as a private members association, right? Which cannot be regulated and cannot be taxed. This is what I mean. What I'm saying that we've got everything that we need in front of us. There's a legal structure there that works where you can run a business which is donation based and it's a private member association and it exists for the benefit of the members, not for the profit of the managing director. It's a different way of looking at things, but we can do it. We can build these structures within the system because what we're having to do is straddle, this is me straddling, 3D, 5D, 4D, right there. But we are straddling dimensions because we are going through a dimensional shift. And because of that dimensional shift, we have to, we're going to manifest the future that we want. But you can't manifest a future just by having a vision board and sticking a picture and throwing on it. You have to take action, okay? Which is why I want to come here, because you guys are taking action and you're educating yourselves and you're inspiring each other. That's the most powerful thing that we can do. And it's amazing to meet people that are doing it because the first two years of this, I was just sat on a laptop talking to myself. Now I've met tens of thousands of people just like you that are doing this all over the world. And it's incredible because we have the power and you are doing it. And I'm so proud to meet all of you. It's unbelievable. And you should be very proud of yourselves because you've just been through the biggest psychological operation in history. Yeah. Right? And you said no. Yeah. That's amazing. To say no in the middle of that is amazing. So, <coughs> how am I doing with time? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Nine o'clock. I said, oh, I can't even start. I've done an hour and a half. Yeah. Jesus, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, I think what I'll do, because I could talk for hours more, but I want to I wanna share this poem, because this poem was really written about all of you, for you, from God. And when I wrote it, amazing things happened to serendipity again. This world-class, Oscar-winning cinematographer who watches my show was nagging me to make, I want to make a film, one of your poems. And I was like, eventually I said, okay, let's do this one. And then he turns up, and then this world-class composer works for free on it, and this world-class editor. And it was all done in three days. Just because what you do intentionally, it just happened. We, we can manifest that. Powerfully, we're incredible. Won't you believe it? So it all came together brilliantly. And then when they sent in the edited version of it, I put it on my office and I listened to it. And then I got, and then I started, and I was in floods of tears because I got this man. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Match an old Sorry, I get emotional. Um, yeah, the message I got was uh, this was for you too, Mark. Oh, thanks. I see you twinkling in the sky, shimmering in Van Gogh's eye. Sparkling as the starseed you really are, you've come so far. Born onto the facsimile earth, all memories erased. 
Not one iota of your talents, of the children you once raised. I see you. You never felt accepted. You never felt the same. Your friends and family, alien, often seemed insane. They pointed fingers at you. They laughed behind your back. Whilst you were dancing with fairies and angels, you were on a different track. I see you. You felt alone. You did your best. You smiled through all the pain. They beat you and abused you. They knew you'd come to end their reign. As winters came and summers left, the leaves fell over years. The spirit voice inside your soul grew louder through your tears. I see you. They broke you down, they tricked you, they stabbed you through the heart. They feasted on your effervescence, they relished you apart. They stole your youth, they stole your money, convinced you they were right. But every time they ripped you open, closer came their night. I see you. Like the caterpillar at the end of life, entombed inside the cocoon, the hero's journey final act when all seems certain doom. Those belittle words of faith and belief diminish amidst the noise, yet you hold on, you won't let go. For the battle, you are poised. I see you! Deep, deep down, you hear the cry. In remembrance, you answer, yes. The fight was laid before you. To come is yet the best. Besmirched, belittled, tossed aside, you nearly lost your way. Letting go of all beloveds, you tried your truth to say. I see. As the veil it dissipated, as all the solids melted, the remnants left fought their way to sovereignty once doubted. You stood your ground, you found your power, your strength became unbounded. For you are the warrior child of this world, in your brilliance our future founded. I see. Don't ever make me run a f***ing sand dune for a f***ing poem again, you <laughs> <laughs>
fortunately, because of people like you, you have a new family and new friends that are going to be here to support you and go forward to this beautiful future that we all know is our birthright. It doesn't happen. We've already won. God doesn't win, he's won. And the message I keep getting, and I'll leave you on this, is very simple. Live today. Don't put your life on hold. Live hard, love hard, laugh hard. Best thing we can do. God bless you.